John, thank you very much. We have four guests today who've experienced this COVID in, 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 in different ways, but I think they kind of illuminate what our fellow Ohioans are going through and have, have gone through. Uh, I, first, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Stephanie Marshall, a respiratory therapist at Grant Medical Center in Columbus. She's been on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, she is a COVID patient. Uh, Stephanie, thank you very much for, for being with us today. We appreciate it very, very much. And I know you're there with your husband, Ryan, uh, who may pick up the conversation at some, some point as you move forward. Uh, can you just tell us, tell us your story? Um, so being a respiratory therapist at Grant, um, you know, we're very busy. Um, so for eight months, taking care of frontline worker or frontline be in front line from ER to um, the ICU intubating patients. Um, we've seen we've seen all of the the good and bad of COVID. And uh, the beginning of November, sorry if I tear up. <laughs> in the beginning of November, um, I developed symptoms of COVID, and um, I ended up having just congestion, sore throat, headache. Really didn't think anything of it. Um, and within 12 hours. I was hospitalized for difficulty breathing. Um, I'm a healthy 37 year old. I have underlying asthma, but that's all. My asthma is under control. So I really didn't think anything, you know, of if I got COVID, I would be okay. Well, um, a lot of people think that, unfortunately, that didn't happen for me. Um, I was hospitalized for two days and um, then I was discharged and I was home for two days and I got um, really bad. Um, I had a developed pneumonia in both of my lungs. And as a respiratory therapist, I knew that I was bad and I knew what was happening to me and that made it scarier. Um, I then was, my husband dropped me off because of my husband and family. I have two small children. Um, because of them being in quarantine, they had to drop me at the door of the ER which was the hardest thing because I knew how sick I was and I didn't know if that was the last time I would ever see my family. And um, they dropped me off at Grant where I work and I was admitted and they told me that I would have to be intubated because I was so bad. Um, I begged for a chance on a BiPAP to not be intubated and um, thankfully that worked and I didn't have to. Um, go on a ventilator, uh, but I was at the hospital for seven days. I was, um, it's really hard to be a COVID patient. I've been on both sides. I've cared for COVID patients and then I've been there myself. It's hard to sit in a room that you can't leave the room and the only people you see are in full PPE and you can't have family, you can't have anyone with you. Um, this virus doesn't even, doesn't just affect your body, but it affects you mentally. The isolation of that is really hard. And um, seeing both sides of it was um, impactful for me and the way I'll treat my patients from now on. And I, I now I'm home, thank goodness, but I am home and I'm still on oxygen. Um, I unfortunately will be getting lumped into the long hauler um, crowd um, and it's, it's been difficult, but, um, we take one day at a time and, um, I just want the word out there to let people know that it doesn't matter who you are. This virus doesn't discriminate. And I'm a healthy 37 year old who has two kids and I've been there and I've watched people die of it. And now I'm going through it myself. So. Well, Stephanie, thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. We, we, it gives us some insight. Uh, you know, we, we hear about people and we look at numbers and statistics, but uh, I, I think it's much more impactful to talk to someone like you who's, who's been through it. And so how are your kids doing? Kids doing they're, okay? They're, they're hanging in there. They're seven and one. So my one-year-old has no idea. My seven-year-old is, is, he's learning how to adjust oxygen. <laughs> Well, 
maybe a, maybe a nurse, maybe a doctor, who knows, huh? I told him maybe you could become a respiratory therapist. Respiratory therapist, who knows, right? Yeah, well, hey, how, how long have you been a resp respiratory therapist? How long? Uh, five years. Five years. Well, you've, you've, dealt, you've dealt with a lot of patients in that time then. Yeah, and uh, I've been at Grant the whole time, and we see a lot, and shout out to all my RTs at Grant. We, we work really hard for not just COVID patients, but trauma patients, and uh, uh, they do a great job. Well, we appreciate what they do, and we appreciate you, and, and good you. luck. Good Thank luck, and best, best wishes to, to, to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming on. We appreciate it very much. Let me uh, move now. We'll talk with Susan uh, Norvell from Middletown. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about her family's experience with COVID. Uh, all four people in her household got COVID, uh, and we've all had different experiences. So, Susan, tell us a little bit about what, you know, what uh, what your experience has been. Um, certainly. Thank you, Governor DeWine. Um, I was uh, the person that was exposed to the COVID virus and inadvertently uh, and unintentionally brought it into our home. Um, our family com is comprised of myself, my husband, Keith, and our twin daughters, Sarah and Allison. And um, it started out, um, I think our story is important because within our family, the four of us, we are just about every case that you could have with COVID. Um, my daughter, Sarah, was, when she tested, she tested negative at first, and I actually had her retest because I just couldn't believe that she was negative. Um, she's been completely asymptomatic this whole time. No fevers, no, no nothing. Uh, my daughter, Allison, and myself, we developed very mild symptoms. Um, we had what sounded like chest congestion, um, no fevers whatsoever. We had the telltale uh, symptom of loss of taste and smell. And then my husband, Keith, he started out kind of the same general congestion, whatnot. He typically gets bronchitis every year, and this is Ohio, so it's typical that you get some sort of respiratory thing each, each season. Um, you know, and, but his symptoms progressed. He um, started running fevers. Uh, they would be low grade, but then they would spike up to about 102, 103, uh, severe muscle aches, severe joint pain. Um, and that just kind of went on for a while. And then I would say probably about um, day 12 or 13. And for the record, he never lost his sense of taste or smell at all, but he did have the fevers. Around day 12 or day 13, it was, it was a Sunday. He was just having a lot of difficulty. He needed to sit up in the recliner in the living room. Um, he was still able to talk, engage in conversation, um, not long-winded stories, but nothing that would indicate that anything was amiss other than he was really, you know, feeling pretty bad, but not terrible. His sister, uh, Jennifer, is a nurse and brought over a pulse oximeter. Uh, so we put it on his finger and I actually thought I put it on wrong because it registered 55%. And I was like, that can't be right. Wow. So we did it again and it was 55%. Ooh. So um, our doctor, Dr. Ganser, told us to call the squad, and we did. And he walked from our living room chair out to the porch, got on the cot, and got into the ambulance, and they transported him. And when he arrived at Atrium Medical Center, his oxygen levels were at 40%. Still talking, still engaging, um, which I've been told by many people that that's, they actually don't know how that's possible. Um, while in the ER, he was diagnosed with pneumonia, which I've been told is a very common complication of COVID. Um, so he got to the hospital, we'll say around 3.30 or 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. That evening around 11 o'clock, I was called and notified that he was moved to the ICU, um, that he was still talking, but to get more one-on-one -on -one care, better oxygen support. Um, by 3.30, 4 o'clock the following morning, so in the span of 16 to 18 hours, um, the nurse told me that she had spoken with Keith and while he was stable, uh, at Atrium Medical Center, a wonderful facility, they had maximized everything that they could do to him, to, to help him and that it was in his best interest and he agreed to it and he was intubated and then care flighted to UC. Um, so he is, uh, he was transported in the middle of the night to UC. He is in a COVID ICU unit. He is still on a ventilator. 
Um, this is two weeks and two days uh, post when everything happened. Um, you know, and that that's where we are. He, um, they just put in a trach yesterday to take him off of the mouth tube um, to prevent damage from that. And currently they are trying to lower his sedation to check his neurological levels. Um, he wasn't very responsive yesterday. So they're doing like an EEG to check brain function. And then they're gonna go around today and check that. Um, but our house, we've had every possible scenario with COVID and that's where we currently are right now. Well, that's, um, that's gonna be very difficult for you, your family to go through that. It, it is. I you can't. You can't see him, right? You can, or you can, you can. Believe it or not, I am actually allowed to visit him. I sit outside the room. I wear double masks okay. because it's just very scary to be in the eye of the storm. But I do get to at least see him, and yeah. he has an amazing medical team. So I just sit outside and I stare at him for an hour every day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing the story. We certainly wish him all the best. Um, Thank you. Comes out of this, and we hope he gets home soon. Thank you. I do as well. I Thank do. You. Thank, Thank you, you for taking time. We really appreciate it. Well, Thank, Thank you. you for having me and listening to our story. Thank you. Dr. Matthew Colflesh um, is a physician for Trinity Health System in Steubenville, in Jefferson County. Uh, the coronavirus has certainly penetrated eastern and southeastern Ohio uh, at a slower pace, initially at least, and, but now it is, it is everywhere throughout, throughout the state. And so, doctor, thank you very much for joining us and, and telling us a little bit about what, you know, what you're seeing in, in the eastern part of the state. Sure. Uh, thank you, Governor, and thank you for reaching out to the people of Jefferson County. Um, I think you... you you have a theme here of different perspectives from different areas of the state. It's so variable. Um, you know, being in a rural area, it's quite different than being at Grant Hospital, being in Cincinnati. Um, we're not in the middle of nowhere. We actually are nearly a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, but we just haven't felt the ramifications of COVID yet. So if you go back to the numbers in our hospital, uh, back in the original surge in April, our peak number of hospitalized patients was nine. So this went through the summertime and we eliminated elective surgery. And at one point uh, there was a, a major reduction in the census of the hospital such that I run a hospitalist group, a group of hospital physicians as well. And I sent advanced practitioners home, I sent doctors home. Um, and then in the middle of the summer with the second peak, we only reached a max of five patients in the hospital. So again, we started to increase activity in the community. Uh, we opened schools. We didn't see a spike. But uh, my theme now is that things are different. Okay. So in the past two weeks, we have reached a point to where our max hospitalization in this hospital right now is 34. Uh, and I would expect that it's going to climb. So, you know, we never felt the same type of impact that others did in the state. And so when restrictions have come, um, there's been a great deal of frustration here. Um, and I think you feel that the fatigue of following the rules, following the mask, following the distancing. But I can tell you that as of now, things are different. So we are now feeling the impact. Uh, the, the type of patients that are coming to the hospital now, those patients that we worried about all along, we planned for them extensively in April. We went through hours and hours of meetings and logistical planning and everything you could think of to make sure that the patients were well taken care of. We were, had a disaster plan. We were accepting patients in the southeast part of the state. But what happened is we ended up just taking patients to help others out, and we didn't have patients in our own community. Um, we were fortunate for that. And we had a number of elderly population that stayed pretty locked down in this community. Um, but I would say as we approach Thanksgiving, the reality is that it has changed and we are stressed. Um, we have always had a problem with nursing. And, and if you ask any hospital representative in this state, they're gonna tell you that they've always had a problem with getting nurses. I mean, this is a national problem. So 
given that the stress and strain of losing any staff right now is impactful and we, we really are feeling that. Uh, so uh, as we lose staff from the virus and as activity picks up and people, you know, in Ohio, we move together in the cold and viruses accelerate. This is the nature of the business and we're used to it in hospital systems. But COVID is different. Uh, it's a nasty virus. We've always known that from having treated it before. We just never treated in this kind of volume before. Um, so yes, now is the time we are feeling it differently. And you touched on a little bit, but the situation with personnel, hospital personnel, nurses, others, how, is, how are you doing in regard to that? And what, what's the future look like, you think? Is yeah, it's, it's a matter of uh, a change day to day. It's planning every day. Uh, every day we, we have meetings constantly to, to reassess that. Uh, we met right before this meeting. So um, as of now, I would say we are stressed. Um, because our nurses in the critical care uh, field are limited. Um, we may have real estate for patients. In other words, we may have beds open, but finding staff is going to be the issue moving forward. And we're always going to be able to manage that in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we're going to serve the community. We've planned for this for many months. And now is come the time where we're actually having to put these uh, plans in place. But I would say as of now, we're, we are very strained. Um, we are trying to reorganize our units. We are trying to gather excess help from other areas that we may have not called from before. Uh, we're asking advanced practitioners here in the near future to help us out, maybe at the bedside, um, some ambulatory nurses to help us out uh, in the acute care setting. So these are the things we have thought through before, um, but in reality it has now hit us to the point where I have concerns about the time around Thanksgiving. And this was late coming to Jefferson County and, and really your, your part of the state uh, didn't get really that much in the spring, I guess, that much in the, in the summer. Um, but what, what's your message then to the people of Jefferson County as far as Thanksgiving and going forward? Yeah. Well, you know, I think people just need to be reasonable. You know, people have been through this long enough to, to see things uh, and, and have their own opinions about how they go about the, uh, the mitigation. But the reality is with our population here of older folks, now is the time to be reasonable with them at Thanksgiving and protect them. Um, I had the same thing happening in my family for the first time. I, you know, I've been an advocate of, of trying to be out and about as much as we could to keep the kids in school as much as we could but I'm, I'm reeling it in myself and saying, you know, for my parents this time, I say, you know, we're going we're gonna to Zoom at Thanksgiving for this for this year until we see how things come out in the coming weeks. Um, you know, certainly we're all waiting for the uh, vaccine, um, but at the same time, we have a great level of protection we have to give in the meantime. Um, I think people can be reasonable. Um, I think the mistakes are being made that are pretty straightforward. People are sick. They're coming in the house. They're getting your mom and dad. There's some things like that that are that are easily solved. And um, I just think at Thanksgiving, we really have to just take a step back and say, you know what, Jefferson County, it, it hit us now. It's here. And um, it's, it's different. Dr. Cole Flesh, thank you. Good luck to you and, and your team there. Uh, we thank them for everything that they do. We know it's a tough, tough job always, and it's even tougher now. So thank you. Appreciate it very, very much. Our fourth guest today is Jasmine Shavers, nurse in Dayton, uh, Miami Valley Hospital, a part of Premier Health. She was there when the very first COVID patient came in. In, in March, uh, she's still caring for patients on an all COVID intensive care unit. Uh, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it very, very much. You, Governor. Look, looks like you're right there at the I, hospital. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Tell us, just kind of tell us what your world is like today, because, you know, we, we read about it, but uh, we see statistics, but you're there. Tell us what you're seeing, what's going on. I would say I've been up here since March with the first COVID patient, and um, I took a break in October, took a little time off to myself. September is when I started seeing the decline of how many patients we had. I thought maybe we're getting a hold of this. We, the census is very low. I come back, uh, we're full again. Patients are more sick. 
um, they're going from being on like five liters of uh, oxygen to needing to be uh, on a vent very quickly. Uh, this third wave, I feel like, is way more intense than it was uh, in March and over the summer. Um, oh, we've had patients in a span of a 12-hour shift, six patients needing to be on a vent. It's been, it's been very bad. Um, I have a couple of couple of stories I like to tell you guys about patients I've had experience sure. uh, on my unit. I had a um, medical professional uh, who said, I, I, I just didn't think it was that serious. I just didn't think that was that serious. And he ended up passing, um, but he was a medical professional, very well educated on certain diseases. And he just, he couldn't grasp the fact that it was that serious and that it was that deadly of a virus. I um, also had another mother I, I talked to that took care of her child because he has some uh, disabilities. Um, but she cried to me on the phone about him. She, he's never been alone without her in his life. And I was in there when the, in the room when he passed. I tried to be that support for her. Um, we're just very, we're overworked, exhausted, tired. We're trying our best. Um, COVID is no joke. Very deadly virus. Uh, when I see people in the community and I wear a mask, I just think to myself, like, I'll see them at the hospital soon. And that's not where I want, that's not where I want to see them. But we as a community have to care about each other and, Hopefully people cooperate so we can beat this virus. Um, with the holidays coming up, I'm not seeing my family. I'm staying at home. And I hope that um, people gather at home uh, with the people they live with. They don't travel. Um, um, and I, I don't, I'm curious to see if people actually follow the rules uh, on Thanksgiving to see if we surge any more because the hospitals are very... Uh, Packed right now. Senses are very high. So I'm curious to see what will come in the next coming weeks or days um, with uh, these COVID cases and how many critical people we're going to see in the next couple weeks. Well, it, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine how bad it would be to be there and, and be the patient and have your loved ones not be able to hold your hand or not be able to see you. But it also has to be very difficult for you to be that person who has to support them and you're, you're it. I mean, you're, you're there with them. The two, two stories you, you, you told us uh, about the, the young, young boy, uh, young man, uh, I just, uh, I just breaks your heart. Particularly if you, you know, if you think you're a parent, you think that's your child in there. It's like, so how, so how are you doing? Are you holding I'm doing pretty thing? good. I've, I, I haven't had any, symptoms. I'm doing very well. I'm making sure I'm protected. My family's fine. So I'm just hoping for the best for the rest of the year. And hopefully this vaccine helps us out because I don't want to see any more people in the hospital than I have to. Well, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thanks is, is so inadequate, but we, we, you know, we, we thank you very, very much and uh, bless you. And um, you know, I, the emotional toll must be there as well, uh, as well as just the physical being, being worn out. So thank you. Thank you for doing it. And thank you for giving us kind of a inside look at kind of what your world is and what, uh, what the reality of it is. Thank you for the opportunity to talk here today, Governor. Thank you. We appreciate it. Bless you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.